Howdy, y'all, and welcome to our course, Databases Demystified, sponsored by Fivetran. I'm your host, Michael Kaminsky. Today is the second part of a two-part series on transactions. If you haven't watched Transactions Part 1, definitely go back and watch that first. Otherwise, you'll be missing some important context and vocabulary for this lesson. We're going to be continuing our discussion of transactions by covering two very important topics for understanding database performance, locks and isolation levels. It's important to keep in mind that for modern databases, they basically have to be able to work in parallel. That is, in order to be fast, we need to be able to process multiple transactions at the same time, especially for transactional databases that need to be able to support scalable applications with lots and lots of users. We expect that they will need to process lots of transactions concurrently. If you have 20 people on your website all checking out at the same time, you can't have the 20th person be forced to wait for all of the other 19 processes to complete first. You want your database to be able to process those transactions at the same time. If they're all different customers ordering different things, one would think that that wouldn't generally be a problem to process those transactions at the same time. But when it comes to an activity like updating the in-stock amount of an item that's on sale, this can actually get pretty tricky. Additionally, anytime you're doing processes in parallel, if they're operating on the same underlying data, you face the danger of what computer scientists call race conditions. Race conditions happen when two processes are trying to change the same data, and the result will change depending on which one gets there first. The two processes are racing to do something, and only one of them can win. So in this example, we have three processes on the right where we're trying to update the balance to different values all at the same time. We can imagine that these were processes kicked off by three different computers in three different branch locations, all simultaneously, and here we have a race condition. The problem is that we might not know at the end of these three processes what the value will be for row one. It all depends on the order that these operations were processed. If the top one is processed last, the balance will be 400. If the middle one is processed last, the balance will be 100. And if the bottom one is processed last, then the balance will be 700. This can end up being a real problem for us. We want to make sure that our databases are robust to race conditions so that we don't introduce bugs into our application because we can't be sure which values will be saved in the database. There are three really common race conditions that people talk about a lot, especially in the context of databases. You don't really need to know in super precise detail what each of these different types of race conditions are, but it is important that you know what race conditions are in general. And it's important that you get a sense for what the different types of issues are that a database might encounter. First, we've got dirty reads, which refers to reading data from a transaction in progress that will eventually be rolled back. That's the example we gave in the isolation section from the last class, transactions part one. Non-repeatable reads happen when data that we rely on for our operation get changed out from under us in the middle of a transaction. Phantom reads happen when additional rows get added or removed during the transaction. There are also lots of other phenomenon that you may encounter, like write skew and dirty writes, and many others that people talk about that don't necessarily have well-recognized or agreed-upon names. All of these are flavors of the same thing, where we have different operations happening at the same time, and you end up having bugs or unexpected outcomes in your application because things that you assume are going to stay constant are actually getting changed out from under you in the middle of your process. This can be very problematic, and it can cause really nasty bugs that can be particularly painful to fix because they both happen infrequently and they tend to violate people's mental models of what their applications are doing. So in databases, we have these things called isolation levels. And again, this matches up to the I and ACID. We talked about this a little bit in the last class. Isolation helps databases prevent race conditions. The more isolation that we have, the fewer race conditions that we'll have, and the fewer of these bugs we'll encounter. But like all good things in this world, this comes with a cost. Increased isolation makes databases slower. Interestingly, in many databases, especially transactional databases, we can choose how much isolation we want between our concurrent transactions. The key thing to know is that different isolation levels exist, and it's important to know what they are at a high level so that when you're reading the documentation or marketing material about a database, you understand what types of bugs you might encounter as the database is processing those transactions. There are four different isolation levels that are widely recognized. There are actually more because some databases have invented their own to describe how their isolation levels work exactly. And there's not even 100% agreement on the ones that do exist. However, for today's purposes, it's just important to know that different isolation levels exist and that they cover a spectrum going from more isolation to less isolation. 
Isolation levels go from the highest level of isolation, known as serializable, at the top, to the lowest level of isolation, known as read uncommitted, at the bottom. At the top, serializable is intended, is intended to mean that transactions are processed and yield the same result as if they were processed in series, as if they were processed one at a time. That is, transactions may only be processed in parallel or concurrently as long as they will yield the same result as if they were processed in series. In descending order of isolation, we have serializable, repeatable reads, read committed, and read uncommitted. Read uncommitted is the least isolated and therefore has the highest likelihood of generating those bug-causing race conditions. We're not going to cover the nuances of exactly how these isolation levels differ from each other. If you're interested, the Wikipedia article on isolation has a really nice breakdown. The key concepts to know are that one, different isolation levels exist. Two, they go from most strict to the least strict. And three, many databases offer the option to choose which isolation level you want. But be careful when choosing isolation levels. Anything less than serializable can cause bugs. But it's important to know, even some databases that say they're serializable really aren't in 100% of cases. It's something to always keep an eye out for. To understand isolation, you really need to understand locks. Locks are, extremely generally speaking, how isolation is implemented in different databases. The people who are programming databases have to figure out how to provide the level of isolation that the application needs, how to make their transactions serializable, and they do that by locking the database. Or, more precisely, locking individual rows, columns, or tables so that other transactions that need to access this data must wait before proceeding. That is, if two transactions want to operate on the same data at the same time, the database will place a lock on the data when the first transaction starts so that any other transactions can't operate on that data until the lock is released. Other transactions have to wait their turn in order to access those data. Different isolation levels will have different locking strategies. Let's take a look at a stylized example to get a feel for how this might work in practice. In this example, we've got two transactions. Transaction one wants to update the balance of row one, and transaction two is going to select that balance for some other operation that it's performing. While transaction one is running, the database is going to place a lock on that row so, so that the select in transaction two will not be able to run until that lock is released. And that's the general idea of a lock. The database is going to say that no other transactions can operate on this particular piece of data until the lock is released by the initiating transaction. An interesting thing to know or think about is that you can have different granularity for your locks. You could have a row lock where you're just locking one row or some other small amount of data. You could have a column lock where you lock an entire column at a time, or a table lock where you lock the whole table. Obviously, for the purposes of speed, you want to lock as little data as possible so that you're blocking as few other transactions as possible. But depending on the complexity and the types of operations that you're performing and on the isolation level that's required, you might actually need one of the larger locks in order to make sure that other transactions aren't reading or manipulating invalid data. One interesting and extremely painful problem related to locking is known as the deadlock. Deadlocks can happen when two transactions are trying to operate on the same data at the same time, and both of them are waiting on each other, and then everything freezes because neither one can proceed until the other releases its lock. In the example that we've given here, transaction one is trying to move money from account one to account two, and transaction two is trying to move money from account two to account one. If transaction two started in the middle of transaction one, depending on how the locks are handled under the hood, there's a chance that we end up in this deadlock situation where neither transaction can complete because they each have a lock on a row that the other one needs. It might sound sort of trivial and academic, but it's actually more common than you might imagine. I've personally battled a number of deadlocks in the systems I've built, and it can be a real pain, but it's a good concept to think about when trying to understand how locks work and how they might cause issues. So the most important thing to know when talking about isolation and locks is that there are performance implications here. There are real trade-offs between isolation level and speed. More isolation means more locks. At a higher level of isolation, your database is going to have to put more locks on different pieces of data that it's working with. More locks means slower transactions. The more locks you have, the more likely it is that you're gonna block another transaction which slows down your application. Slower transactions make sad users. We want our apps to be as fast as possible. And if our users have to spend ages staring at a little spinning beach ball on our website, then they're going to be more likely to bounce or to churn or to not check out, or in general, just to not do the thing that we are hoping that they will do. So that's the trade-off. If we have more isolation, we'll have fewer bugs related to race conditions, 
but our application will be slower because we can't process as much in parallel. Another key piece of vocabulary related to these concepts is the idea of contention. The more transactions there are that need to access the same rows, the more contention there is. So under a production load, where we have lots of users that are manipulating the data in the database, there will be more contention for those rows and those data than in a testing database that doesn't have any users. Performance under contention, your database speed under contention, can be much worse than when the operations are performed without any contention in a test database, without even taking into consideration the additional load on compute resources or memory. This is a thing that bites people really frequently when they test an operation on a test database that's actually fully isolated. That operation completes really quickly, but then when they roll it out into the production database on a database that's being used by lots of different users, they see way more problems because now there is contention for the data. Transactions are locking rows and blocking other processes, and that can make a huge difference. While the database is in use and the database is trying to put locks on lots of different pieces of data, other processes aren't going to be able to complete as fast. It's important to know that the way that a database performs under contention can be very different from how it performs when there are no other transactions locking up parts of the data. So let's summarize. Isolation level determines how likely race conditions are in our database. If we have more isolation, we'll have fewer race conditions, and if we have less isolation, we'll have more race conditions. These race conditions can lead to bugs that can be very difficult to deal with. Isolation levels can vary across and within databases. Each database implements these different isolation levels a little bit differently. If you're working closely with these databases, it's really important to make sure to read the documentation closely, and even test it if you can, to make sure that the database is going to work the way that you expect it will when different processes are operating in parallel. More isolation means more locks and slower transactions, and that will in turn slow down the application that is using the database. And finally, database locking can cause unanticipated problems under production workloads. People often forget about the locking that's happening under the hood, and you need to make sure that you're testing any jobs that will be performed on a production database appropriately. And that's it. Hopefully you all learned something today. Don't forget to like this video and subscribe to our channel. It really helps us a lot by helping other people find our lessons. We are hard at work on the next episode where we're going to talk about distributed databases and distributed computing in general. This is a really important topic and it's super fascinating and I hope we'll see you there. Stay safe and we'll see you in the next one.